Unit 4.5 practice problems. Two moles of a sample of fluorine gas reacts with excess sodium hydroxide, according to the equation above. If the reaction is repeated with excess sodium hydroxide, but with one mole of fluorine gas, which of the following is correct? So we're looking at limiting reagents, things that would happen if we decrease the amount of reactant. We are going from two moles to one mole. We still have an excess of sodium hydroxide, so I'm not worried about that but I am decreasing my uh, number of moles of fluorine by half by going from two moles to one mole. So I would decrease the amount of product that I am able to make. Um, option A says that the product would be doubled. Option C says it would remain the same. That's impossible since I have less fluorine. Option D says it would be doubled, also impossible, I have less fluorine. Option B is the only option choice that says that uh, we would decrease the amount of product and it also uh, decreases by the correct amount since I go from two to one and I am decreasing by half. A 100 milliliter sample of 0.1 molar magnesium chloride and a 100 milliliter sample of 0.2 molar sodium hydroxide are combined with magnesium hydroxide. Um, were combined and magnesium hydroxide uh, precipitated as shown in the equation above. If the experiment is repeated using solutions of the same molarity, which of the following changes in volume will double the amount of magnesium hydroxide produced? So um, we want to look at uh, the limiting reagent here. We have um, a relationship of one magnesium chloride to one magnesium hydroxide and two sodium hydroxides for every one magnesium hydroxide. So I am uh, not able to change the molarity. However, I am uh, trying to double the amount that I am producing, which means that I am looking to uh, double the number of moles. If I can't double the molarity, I need to double the volume. So same volume of magnesium chloride, but twice the volume of sodium hydroxide would not increase my product since I would be limited by the magnesium chloride. Twice the volume of magnesium chloride, but half the volume of sodium hydroxide, I would be limited by the amount of sodium hydroxide, not helpful. Twice the volume of magnesium chloride and twice, or in the same volume of sodium hydroxide, that would again limit me by the sodium hydroxide. However, using twice the volume of magnesium chloride and twice the volume of sodium hydroxide doubles the amount of moles of both I have present within the solution without altering the concentration of the solution. The reaction between glucose and oxygen is represented by the balanced chemical equation above. In an experiment, 0.3 moles of carbon dioxide was produced from the reaction of 0.05 moles of glucose with an excess of oxygen. The reaction was repeated by th with the same temperature in the same container, but this time 0.6 moles of uh, carbon dioxide was produced. Which of the following must be true? So we uh, doubled the amount of carbon dioxide that was produced. We still have an excess of oxygen, so that means that our limiting reagent, which was the glucose, must have been increased uh, by twice the amount. Since we produced twice the amount, we must have input twice the amount into the reactants. So the initial amount of glucose in the container must have been 0.1 molar. Um, we went from 0.5 to 0.1. That is a doubling, which would account for the doubling of uh, the carbon dioxide that's produced. So that sounds good. Uh, exactly 0.3 moles of glucose must have reacted because the carbon atoms were cons uh, conserved. Uh, since we have an excess of oxygen, we're going to assume that we have gone to completion and therefore um, not changing the number of moles of glucose is not going to increase the amount that we're going to produce. Exactly 0.4 moles of oxygen must have reacted. Um, we were dealing with an excess of oxygen, which means that it was definitely not the limiting reagent. So changing it to be a specific amount isn't going to help us since we are assuming that um, any and all of the um, glucose that needed to react with oxygen had plenty of oxygen to react with. So limiting the amount is not going to help. Uh, more than 0.6 moles of oxygen must have reacted. 
Um, again, oxygen was not the limiting reagent, so uh, putting a specific number to oxygen is not going to help us uh, get to a specific amount of um, glucose that was reacted. Instead, increasing the amount of glucose that was reacted is the only thing that is going to account for twice the amount of product that we have. At 27 degrees Celsius, five identical two liter vessels are filled with nitrogen gas and sealed. Four of the five vessels also contain 0 .5, 0.05 mole sample of sodium bicarbonate, sodium bromide, copper, or iodine, as shown in the diagrams above. The volume taken up by the solids is negligible. The initial pressure of nitrogen in each vessel is 720 millimeters of mercury. All four vessels are heated to 127 degrees Celsius and allowed to reach constant pressure. At 127 degrees Celsius, the entire sample of iodine is observed to have vaporized. What does the mass of vessel 5 at 127 compare to its mass at 27 degrees Celsius? So this entire statement is a whole lot of I don't care. Um, we can ignore the entire top portion of that question. Uh, this is the only portion that I care about. It is a sealed container, and even though we have um, heated it up, it is still sealed, which means that no mass was capable of, of escaping, which means that the mass has to be exactly the same based off of the law of conservation of mass. So option A says that the mass is less since it's vapor. Uh, that's not how matter works. Even if it's not in the same state that it was initially, the mass doesn't get to just disappear. The mass is the same since the number of each type of atom in the vessel is constant. That is uh, correct, that's looking good. The mass is greater um, since it will react with nitrogen forming um, this compound here, which is a greater molar mass. Um, if we keep the same number of atoms, we don't get to increase or decrease the mass. The mass is greater since the pressure is greater. Uh, nobody do that. Again, um, the mass has to be the same since we did not add any or take away any um, mass from the sealed container just by heating it up. So option choice B is our only choice that makes any sense. According to the equation above, how many moles of potassium chlorate must be decomposed to generate one liter of oxygen at standard temperature pressure? So um, we are looking for the relationship between potassium chlorate and oxygen. So you just look at the uh, coefficient in front of potassium chlorate and the coefficient in front of oxygen. We are going from uh, moles of um, potassium chlorate to uh, moles of oxygen, which means that I need the moles of potassium chlorate to be at the bottom so that they cancel and uh, moles of oxygen to be at the top. So I need two to be at the bottom and three to be at the top. The only one that matches that is option choice uh, D. Oh, sorry, um, my apologies. We are looking for uh, the, uh, we're looking to convert to the number of moles of potassium chlorate, not from the moles of potassium chlorate, my apologies. So we are uh, starting in liters of, uh, oxygen and then we are going to uh, moles of oxygen so we are dealing with that there is um, 22.4 liters per one mole of oxygen and then we need to get out of oxygen and into uh, the potassium chlorate so that means we have uh, three moles of oxygen per every two moles of uh, potassium chlorate that's why it's very important to read the question and check again that um, we did read the question correctly. So my apologies. Um, but we are uh, dealing with uh, the moles of oxygen being at the bottom. The only ones uh, where that is true is going to be option choice A and C. However, the uh, coefficient in front of potassium chlorate is two. So that means we are dealing with option choice C as our only option. A 20 milliliter sample of 0.2 molar uh, potassium carbonate solution is added to 30 milliliters of 0.4 molar barium nitrate solution. 
barium carbonate precipitates. The concentration of barium ions in the solution after a reaction is. So this is dealing with um, limiting reagents. And since we're dealing with limiting reagents, we do need to figure out um, who our limiting reagent is and figure out uh, how much we could realistically produce based off of what we have present here. So um, we need the balanced chemical equation between potassium carbonate and barium nitrate. So I'm just going to give myself a little bit of room there so that I can write, write that out. And we know that we are producing uh, barium carbonate. This is a double replacement reaction. So um, we are switching our um, anions here. Okay, um, luckily for us, the uh, balancing just requires a two in front of the potassium nitrate. So um, now we know our uh, molar relationship between everything. Uh, luckily for us, it is a one-to-one uh, -one between anything that I'm interested in, so that's very nice. So I just need to go ahead and figure out how many, um, how many moles of uh, carbonate I have and how many moles of uh, the barium I have. So I have uh, 20 milliliters of uh, the potassium carbonate need to convert it out of milliliters and uh, then I can use the uh, molarity 0.2 moles per one liter so 20 times 0.2 divided by a thousand okay so uh, 0 0.004 moles of uh, carbonate are available and then um, I am dealing with uh, the 30 mils of the barium nitrate convert out of milliliters and then I can use the concentration Um, the relationship between barium and carbonate is uh, one to one. I get one barium for every one carbonate here. Uh, and so uh, the difference between these two is going to be uh, how much barium I have left over. So I have 0 0.0008 moles of uh, just barium that was not able to react with carbonate since there was a limit of, of, of carbonate. And then I'm looking for the uh, concentration, so that means I need to divide it by the total volume. So we're going to assume that volume is additive here, which isn't the best assumption, but it's kind of the only thing that we got. Um, we have 30 and 20, so that is going to be uh, 50 milliliters, but we're going to convert that to liters real quick. So 50 divided by 1,000 gives me 0 0.05 liters. So 0 0.0008 divided by 0 0.05 gives me uh, point, oh, sorry. Um, I thought that looked a little bit strong, uh, a little bit small. I accidentally uh, included one too many zeros there. So my apologies, let me erase that. So. 0 0.008 uh, divided by uh, 0 0.05, okay, uh, gives me 0 0.16 molar, and uh, that is option choice B. A mixture of gases containing 0 0.2 moles of uh, sulfur dioxide and 0 0.2 moles of oxygen 
and a four liter flask reacts to form uh, sulfur trioxide. If the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, what is the pressure of the flask after the reaction is complete? So um, we are going to be using the ideal gas law. So PV equals NRT. Okay, and we are looking for pressure. So we are going to go ahead and uh, divide both sides by volume. So pressure is equal to the number of moles times the ideal gas law constant times our temperature divided by our volume. Now, um, we were given temperature in Celsius. This is not appropriate for the ideal gas law equation. We do need it to be in Kelvin, so I can eliminate any where we did not convert to Kelvin. Um, then the uh, things that I'm going to be looking for uh, is my volume, uh, it's four liters, that is the same across all of them. So my differential is going to be um, how many moles I have present. So um, we are adding our number of moles together. So we have 0.2 of sulfur dioxide and 0.2 of oxygen. So 0.2 plus 0.2 would give me um, um, however, this is after completion, so it is not actually 0.4. So um, we are looking at our uh, limiting reagents here, and um, we can see that we need double the amount of sulfur dioxide for every um, oxygen since we have the relationship of 2 to 1. So the full 0.2 moles is going to uh, form here, and uh, half of the uh, moles of the sulfur dioxide is going to contribute to the production of the sulfur trioxide. However, about half is going to be left over, so 0.1. So now that we have accounted for um, the amount that is going to be used up in the reaction, we are able to see that 0.1 plus 0.2 is going to give us 0.3 moles of uh, of uh, total uh, moles left in the container after we have a reaction started. When a student adds 30 mils of a one molar hydrochloric acid solution to 0.56 grams of powdered iron, a reaction occurs according to the equation above. When the reaction is complete at 273 Kelvin and one atmosphere, which of the following is true? So um, we're looking for a limiting reagent here and figuring out um, what we are actually able to produce. So uh, 30 mils is going to be 0 0.03 liters of uh, one mole, so that is going to be 0 0.03 moles. And then um, the mass of iron so the mass of iron on our periodic table is 55.85. Oops. So figuring out the number of moles that that is, uh, that is in 0.56 grams is uh, 0 0.01 approximately moles of iron. Okay, um, I can see that the relationship is going to uh, be that iron is going to be my limiting reagent. Uh, since the relationship is uh, two to one for uh, hydrochloric acid. Uh, so we have um, hydrochloric acid is in excess. 0.1 moles of hydrochloric acid remains unreacted. Um, that is more moles than we had initially, so that's definitely not going to happen. Um, hydrochloric acid is in excess. 0.2 moles of hydrochloric acid um, remains unreacted. Um, so the relationship is two to one. So we need for every, for this fully, so for 0 0.01 moles of iron to react, we would need 0 0.02. Uh, moles of hydrochloric acid. So uh, that's how much is going to be used. So that's definitely not correct. Uh, point uh, 
0.015 moles of iron to chloride is produced. Uh, relationship is one to one. We can't produce more moles than we initially put in. Uh, so our limit is 0 0.01. So 0 0.015, definitely not gonna happen. Um, and then our only option left is that uh, 0.22 liters of hydrogen has been produced. And since everything else has been eliminated based off of logic, we can go ahead and say that option choice D has to be our answer. Reaction two occurs when an excess of uh, six moles of hydrochloric acid solution is added to 100 mils of uh, sodium hypochlorite of unknown concentration. If the reaction goes to completion and 0 0.01 moles of chlorine was produced, what was the molarity of the uh, sodium hypochlorite? So um, the reaction here, we have hydrochloric acid reacting with sodium hypochlorite. So that would be reaction number two. Okay, uh, the reaction is two moles of sodium uh, of hydrochloric acid for every one mole of uh, sodium hypochlorite. We are producing um, 0 0.01 uh, moles of chlorine. Uh, we definitely know that we have um, more of the uh, hydrochloric acid here. So we have 100 mils of this. So that would be uh, 0 0.1 liters. Uh, so that would give us 0 0.6 moles of the hydrochloric acid, um, which would be the max amount, but we only produce 0 0.01. And uh, the relationship is two to one. So we would uh, at most be able to produce 0.3. So we definitely know that the sodium hypochlorite is our uh, limiting reactant. There, and um, we are looking for a molarity. So we uh, can assume that we have produced this uh, number of moles in this amount of liters. So um, 0 0.0 zero one divided by 0 0.1 gives me 0 0.1 um, as my answer, um, which is going to be option choice C. If equal masses of compounds undergo complete combustion, which of the following uh, will yield the greatest mass of carbon dioxide? So um, it is not equal molar, it is equal masses. And um, we do need uh, the greatest proportion of carbon being uh, the greatest portion of mass coming from each of these. So looking at these, I have benzene uh, C6H6 versus uh, cyclohexane of C6H12 versus glucose at C6H12O6 and then methane at CH4. So my greatest proportion of carbon in all of these um, hydrocarbons is going to be that of benzene, meaning that it, if I produce, if I burn enough of it, um, I'm going to produce the most carbon uh, dioxide since I had the most carbon in the first place. A sample of a compound that contains only the elements carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen is completely burned in oxygen. To produce 44 grams of carbon dioxide, 45 grams of water, and some nit uh, nitrous oxide. A possible empirical formula for the compound is, so we're going to find uh, the number of moles of um, carbon and uh, hydrogen here. Um, and then that relationship will help clear up uh, what my possible um, uh, empirical formula is. So carbon dioxide um, has a mass of approximately 44. So this means that this is approximately one mole, okay? And then um, water has a mass of approximately 18. So 45 
divided by 18 it means that we have a mass of approximate or a mole amount of approximately 2.5 so I am going to have to double this uh, to make this a uh, whole number so that means that we would need uh, two carbons five hydrogens so that would be option choice C oh my apology I shouldn't have uh, doubled carbon dioxide as well I should have only uh, doubled the water um, whenever I was uh, adjusting it to be a whole number so my apologies so it should be one to five and then we have just some number of uh, nitrogen. And so the only relationship that is one to five is going to be option choice B.